So that brings us to, um, I guess, the keynote part of the input that you've all turned up for. Um, so John Whitty has had a phenomenal track record of providing value into the PMI community, into the project management community here in Queensland nationally, um, and probably fair to say globally um, through his research and involvement in the education sector. Um, John has presented uh, at several conferences here in Queensland, he's presented at several chapter meetings before um, and never failed to entertain. Um, he's a charismatic and uh, pretty, oh, I don't know, light guy, oh. but this is what you said. No, I <laughs> he actually told me, don't, don't give a ridiculous introduction and do not try to wrap up my presentation. So without further ado, I did want to have a bit of a joke about it, but I'd like to invite John Reed to the, to the microphone uh, for his presentation. I really want to infect you with some ideas about things uh, to the point that they're going to disturb you a lot. Uh, they keep me up awake at, at, at night, so um, I hope they keep you up as well. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a few of the points. My talk is titled, there's still something, but there's something missing. Um, what, what's missing is a conversation. Is missing a conversation about capability. We don't talk, we use the word loosely. So I'm going to be telling you that there's this conversation is missing about capability. And it doesn't mean that whether something is capable of something or not. It's a bit more complicated than that. These people that we call project managers, I think, are all trapped. They're all stuck in a cage. And unfortunately, the, uh, I'm going to try and those people who are project managers, they probably know. Is everybody a project manager? Is everybody a project manager? Most people are project managers. You're in the right meeting? Yes? Okay, cool. Um, well, what we're going to do this evening is perhaps forget that you're project managers. Okay? Just step out of the role for a second. So it makes it a lot easier to examine what's happening in the project management. One of the things I think is happening is that there is a big split, there's a divide happening between what's happening with project management as it's taught, as it's presented, and the divide between what project managers actually do. What you actually do and the tools that you need to do your job. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to tell you that I'm going to show you why this comes about, how this has come about. And it's not bad. It's not like the it's not like Star Wars that there's a Sith or there's the dark side of the force that's doing something nasty towards you. It just happens like this. So I'm going to explain to you how it happens. And then I'm also going to show you perhaps some alternatives. Some alternatives of how we can start talking about this concept of capability. So, what I've done is I've put these in red cards, as in you know, a red card that you get. So it's not, you're not free to talk about what you really do. It's quite hard to stand out in a PMI, and I'm going to pick on all the other contributors, by the way, okay? So the APM, the AIPM, uh, the PMI, and, and all these different institutes, I, 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 I'll, I'll pick on them all. We're not actually free to stand up and talk about what we really do. We end up having to give a presentation a little bit about, we have to use the words of project management literature. We have to talk about Gantt charts and time cost quality triangles and all this sort of stuff. Okay? One of the things you're also not free to do is use the tools you actually need and abandon the tools that aren't helpful. To keep you caught up in a methodology. So if you're caught, if you're using Prince 2, you don't have the option to pick and choose some of the things you can and can't use. You're taking a lot more production. Also, there's probably tools there that you would like that aren't being developed to help you do what you need to do. We don't talk about capability and the lack of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that there's another way of thinking about what project work is. So nothing to do with this is sort of start, it's sort of finish, and it's sort of budget. But I'm going to try and get the reality of what project work actually is. Is right? Other than these standard textbook definitions. We're not free to say that your work is messy, unpredictable, and frankly sometimes the control of it is rather tenuous. 
we don't, we don't, we don't stand up and we, we win the PMI Project Manager of the Year Award. And we stand up there and we sort of say, well, actually, no suit is that. And uh, you don't say that. Right? You can't say that, right? Luck, you see, but it was luck, but actually it came along and it was a, uh, a, a it was actually a positive thing that happened and I sort of sold it as though I thought of it in the first place. Uh, we kind of don't talk about these things. To acknowledge we spend lots of your time managing people's expectations. Do people agree with that? Managing people's expectations. You don't find an awful lot of that, that in a textbook about project management. How to do that. I mean we talk about it. But what we want is like tools on the table to show me what I can use. If I'm going to go out tomorrow and manage some of these expectations, what am I going to use? It's all well and good to just say it. Because you actually need something there. And also to mention, we're not free to mention that we continually fail to learn from past project experiences. We all talk about lessons learned and stuff. But it just ends up being just all these words that we say. And you know, I, I, I work with organizations here in town who continually say, look, the last time we built this, whatever it is, we mucked that up. We're building another one now, and I bet we're going to muck that up again. Because somehow we don't seem to. These things get too big, they get complex, and we don't learn from past experiences. So I'm going to try and address some of these points as we go through this. So, Here's the cage. Let me just introduce you a little bit about um, why I think this situation has come about. Now, some of the research that I do, what I do, is I use an evolutionary lens. So, I've got a set of lenses for you, right? See this? Now, what I have. When I look at when I look through the world with this set of lenses on, like any set of lenses, I see things differently to you. I don't see people sitting around on chairs and tables having a glass of wine. I see things in terms of evolution in terms. So I see these things in terms of competition, scarce resources, predators, prey, that sort of stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I look at project management through an evolutionary lens. When I do, I can show you a situation that's going on in project management which I don't think is good. Normal, uh, when you look at David wrapped him around the television, you see, this, you see the natural world. You see, you see cheetah and gazelle chasing each other. Now, what you need to know about this in terms of evolution is these things are co-evolution, evolved together. Cheetahs eat fast food. Right? I'll stop now because it's quite funny. Cheetahs eat fast food. Gazelles are incredibly fast. The ones that survive are the ones that get to replicate, they get to reproduce. The cheetahs that get to catch one, that run incredibly fast, they get to replicate, they get to do this. The ones that don't run fast enough, they die off, their gene pools go. The gazelles that run too slow, they don't jerk quick enough back and forth, they get eaten, their genes go. When I use my evolutionary glasses, I also see the natural, the social world the same way. So hopefully you'll never look at coals and woolies and see things the same. So coals, you see the structure of the cheetah has evolved in order to catch that thing. In the same way that the structure of bullies and cults has evolved to capture you. Look at it, It's a fantastic machine to take the money out of your pocket. Right? You, walk, you think that they want to sell you food, but that's not what they like to do. So you walk in and the whole structure of the about oh, them is to make it easy to try and hand over money. But what they do is they compete against each other. It's not true evolution, because of course we've agreed to stop coals from petrol warming woodies. I know they're not like wipe each other out. But they do compete. And they have structures in place to do this. In the same way that you have, you can replace things like the PMI, the AIPM, and so forth. 
So this, this is what I see when I see my other set of evolutionary lenses. I see social structures like this compete. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a bit of a uh, bit of an exercise. So what I want to show you is, is I want to show you that the stuff that you see in the pin box and in the books and so forth is a little bit different than the stuff that you actually do. So we're going to have a little exercise. I'll let you get your pencil out or your pen. Doesn't matter. I could have given you a USQ pen, but it wouldn't work. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a little exercise. It's almost like a little bit of hypnosis, okay? So what I'd like you to do for a second, you don't, you don't have to close your eyes, but it's a good idea to close your eyes. Nobody's going to steal anything from you, all right? But what I'd like you to do for a second is closing your eyes just detached you a little bit from the room. So I'd like you to just close your eyes for a second. And I'd like you to have a think about a project. Bring to mind a project that's had an impact on you. Might have been the people that were involved in it, the money that was involved in it. Okay, has everybody got some sort of project to mind? Because I'm going to ask you a question about this project. So it's a project you need to be managing or working. Okay, so back into the room then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you this question. The experience of managing this project was like, now I would like you to answer that by drawing it. You can't write any words down, you have to draw it. So the experience of managing that project was like, and draw what that experience was like. Have a go. What was it like? Draw something that represents the experience of managing that project. You need to draw something because I'm going to be able to share with some of the next things. So there are some of them. So, if I said to you, draw that project, what was it like? It was like, and this drawer. Has everybody got something? Okay, if you got something, turn to the person next to you and share it with them. Show what you got. So one of the things you'll notice is all the laughter going on here. You realize what strange lot of people we are when we're up here. So look, so, sometimes when I do a workshop with some stuff, I can go around the room and ask people what they got. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, just some examples of the things that I've had over the years. <laughs> right, so I'm not quite sure where this person sort of sounds as a target, or I'm going to shoot something. Uh, here's another one. Anybody can draw any bombs or exploding things? Yeah, a few of those. A few of those exploding bombs, okay. This one? <laughs> yes, this is actually what you can see that can. Can you have something similar to that? Yeah, okay, there's a couple. Uh, this one here. Uh, this guy, this guy is actually, this is actually the this turns out to be the project manager. This is the stakeholder, and this guy says, said to me, look, this guy's pointing at this bloody chart. He said, no way fiddling about that. There's a massive tornado coming behind me. <laughs> uh, this one, anybody draw an octopus? Anybody draw an animal of some sort? You notice this one's anatomically incorrect. Uh, it has, in the days when the pinball had the nine areas, this has nine legs. Right? Uh, this one, uh, I know this was quite good. Um, it's uh, he's a all starts off miserable. Uh, it, it's uh, even more miserable, and then all of a sudden he starts to smile. Let me get an idea, and off we go. We get some sort of plan, and we get in the car, and oh, it's production, 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 and we go straight across the finish line and go slam into that. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things that you find when you do this exercise with people is when you ask them, well I've done this a lot now, I've been doing this for about 10 or more years. Uh, I'd like to hang on to some of those if, uh, if, if you could. Yeah. What you realize is there's a big emotional 
part of managing budget work. Um, one of the studies we did uh, is we actually got people to, we actually, it was a great study, um, and a couple of them, some of them with the drawing, this one was a musical instrument with a xylophone. And you get them to talk about the project. So you get them to talk about the project and what, how, it, how it unfolded. And you say, okay, so instead of drawing the project, you say, can you play it? Just bang it along, right? And of course, they sort of start and go to the TV. As it goes, and there's an open pause. And then you sort of get them to tell the story about what happened and how it went along. And you get this. You see this sort of pattern here? This sort of calmness, and then there's a burst. And then there's a calmness, and then there's a burst, and then so on. And this is a repeated type pattern you start to see. So this is the sort of emotional response that people get to a type of work. So the term that I'm going to use here is projecty. Some work is more projecty than others. It's a wrong thing to say that something's a project and something's not. Right? It's a very binary rule to say that that's operational and that's a project. You've got to, go to realize that the reality of the world is that there's all sorts of work. And what you find is, is some of the work is fairly smooth, and some of the work just isn't. Okay. It's spiky, it's emotional, it's aggravating, it's a little bit calm. It's spiky, it's emotional, it's aggravating. It's like the drawing you've drawn. But there's got some sort of aspect to it. So some work will be more projecty than others. Actually, just as a side note, here's an interesting thing. Let me do my talk. If you were to look at people who develop games like Xbox and PlayStation, they know all about this. They know exactly how to, how to fiddle with your emotions while you're playing an Xbox game. And it's exactly the same profile. Right. So it's kind of like what you're doing is running a real Xbox game with real people. You have quiet time, then you're going to get a gun out and shoot them. All right. So what I want to do is I want to try and so, so hang on to that thought for a second. The, th the thought to hang on to is there's some work which is less projecty, some work which is more projecty. It's due to the sort of spikiness and the emotional response. So the next thing then is to properly define what a project is. What is project work? Forget all the PMI stuff and the AIPM stuff. Have a think about, have a think about work, not just you doing an activity. Now, this is a factory. Pretty much everything that we see in terms of an organization, we call them as a factory. Stuff goes in, stuff happens to it, stuff comes out. Pretty simple. So it can be an ordinary factory, and we'll bring some jobs or whatever, green balls, and they turn them into squares, or it can be a hospital. You have sick people coming in, and we have various processes, data, the surgery, accident, emergency, and we have well picked care of the end. We have school, and we have school kids coming in, etc., 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 and coming out. So you can, you can plant your business in terms of a factory like this. Each one of these parts, you can call them in order to. This is in order to do this, this is in order to do that, this is in order to do something else. Just have a think about this for a second. If you, if, you look, if you look at a real factory, here's a factory, and we've got something coming in. It's all organized. It's all in a process and system. If you draw, if you draw this out, you'll get this. This is a Gantt chart. Gantt charts are the wrong tool for managing, managing project. They were never invented for managing project. Gantt charts were, met, were invented by, well, not Henry Gantt. There was a guy called Adeniki before him, Polish fellow, who basically, he called them harmonograms. And they were to bring harmony to work. In other words, when you build a factory, how do you tinker with it? So gap charts were made for when you build a factory and you want to optimize them, you tinker with them. So you're dealing with work, which you don't have a factory for. So it's the wrong tool for a start. So what is project work? 
if there's an order to break down, if we can fix it emotionally, we're fairly smooth. It feels okay. We've got all the right tools, we've got all the right people, we've got all the right stuff. We can put this thing back together and it works. We might want to change these things at the end. So not, a pro, uh, not only may part of the um, factory break down, but we may want a new part of the factory. This is a new part of the factory. We may have all the capability to put this thing. But if we don't, if we don't have the capability to put it in, we don't have the knowledge, skills, the right amount of money, the right amount of resources, the right buy-in from people, then it starts to get a bit project. Can you start to see how this starts to get a bit turbulent to manage? So the thing I want you to start to realize here, and this is the scale, that this projectiness has got to do with capability. So, I need a volunteer. Who can juggle? Who can juggle three balls? Oh, come on. Can you juggle? Come on. Come on. So I'll put the mic down for a second. You can hear me just for a bit. Yep. All right, so I'm going to give you a task. So the task is, quite a simple task, juggle these three balls. All right? <laughs> Not bad. Pretty good. Keep going. A bit of pressure. A bit of pressure. OK, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, we're going to the basics there. Well done. All right, of course. So anybody else? No, no, hang on a second. Anybody else, Joe? Yes, okay. Come on. So while we're distracting and looking at somebody else. Alright, okay. So we got we've got a task. Juggling three balls. There you go. Ah, excellent. Okay, that's fine. Now, how do you do you feel quite okay with this? Yeah. Do you feel a bit stressed? Yeah. Alright. Bit projecty. Right? It's a little bit spiky. It's a little bit spiky. Carry on. Let's see you juggle it. Away you go. Well, can, I just, can I just swap one of those balls in? There you go. There you go. There you go. All right. Okay. Fire away. All right. Can I, can I give you one of these? Can I give you one? Let me have my... Oh, I need that ball, right? Let me have that ball. Give me my cup into that ball. Okay. There you go. Right. Okay. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. Can I do that then? Okay. Oh, he's pretty good. So what I'm trying to illustrate, you see, these incredibly capable people. The capability is not to do necessarily with the skill. Thank you very much. Do I applause? Capability is not necessarily to do with the skill. I can eat packets. I can stand there and poke you. Ow, ow, ow. And it's really hard to juggle when somebody's poking you, screwing you with a glass of hose or something. So I can reduce your capability by changing your environment. You get that? It's, so capability is not just about the person's skill. It's about it's connected to the whole environment. If you fiddle with that environment, all of a sudden people tell you that you can't have the money that they said they're going to give you. You can't have the resources that they said they were going to promise you. All of a sudden your capability plummets. And then it gets a bit projected. This is what project work is. Is that okay? It's not to do with the start and the finish. Everything's got to start and finish. It's got to do with capability. So the trouble is, is that we're not talking about this in project management. We're talking about other stuff. We're talking about PMP exams. We're talking about account charts. We're talking about learning value stuff. We're talking about time and cost quality. We're talking about all those other things. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? See, when you go to Coles, remember Coles and Woolies, they can be there, right? Remember my English new classes? I see them as, well, I might see them as predators. When you go in there and you see all this stuff, it looks fantastic. But you've got to realize that this has been chosen, not by you. You can choose this stuff. You've got four choices of apples, by the way. You don't have two choices, because choose two is not enough people to complain. 
If you had 16 choices of apples, people would, well, the stuff would go off for the start because people wouldn't buy all the range of apples. So you've got four. This has all been designed nicely, right? When you look at the fruits that you get, over the last couple of, there's an athlete couple of hundred years, uh, and has a couple of hundred years uh, as far as watermelons are concerned. This is what watermelons used to look like in the 1800s. So we know this because they were painted. This is what they look like now. This is what carrots look like now. This is what a natural carrot looks like. If you keep, if you keep selectively breeding from this carrot and looking for straightness and orangeness, eventually over many generations you'll get one of them. And you keep breeding these things because they sell quite good in the shop. You buy them. Same thing as the watermelons. But the fruit and veg that's sold here is picked for lots of other reasons other than flavor. <coughs> flavor's on there, of course. You know, if you taste the rubbish, you can buy it and it can sell. But it's not top of the list. Top of the list is things like how long it will last on the shelf, whether it be transported well, how good it looks. You go over by moldy looking apples, you know they're fantastic flavor. They will pick them up. So there's a whole pile of reasons why things have been chosen here and put on this shelf. There's a whole pile of reasons why the things you're dealing with in project management are picked. And they've got to do with things like doing, well, I get on the way by some of the markets. Okay. Some of the reasons that things get picked in project management is because they're easy to pass on. Some of the stuff that you talk about in project management gets picked because it's easy to pass on. Let me give you an example of this. I'm going to try this out, right? So this is me trying to life stunt. Can anybody make a paper airplane? You can all make paper airplanes. This is how you make a paper airplane. Let me show you. I'm going to put the mic down. You fold it in half. You make some uh, bends like this. You make some wings. Is this the kind of sort of paper airplane you folks make? Yeah. Then you throw the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> but it flies like that. I bet yours flies like that. Does it? Do you know why? See, because that paper airplane in your head exists for one simple reason, and that is because it entertains a four-year-old. Because you make it for kids. That's what we ever make for paper airplanes. We make them for kids. And kids learn how to make them, and then they pass them on. I'm going to try this. It'll probably be fairly spectacular. So let me give you an example in project management. People do, have you heard of activity on a note and activity on an arrow? Yeah, probably heard of this stuff? You, you, we are often told activity on an arrow is kind of like, oh, it's, you know, it's old, it's like, it's like vowels used to be in televisions. We don't use that anymore. Actually, actually, it's because people invented post-it notes, and people invested, invented Microsoft Project, and that all uses an activity on a note. And you're polluted by the activity. Whereas activity on an arrow, if I show you how it actually works, I give you a pen and you can love it forever. It's a little bit more complicated, like that. It takes a bit more time to learn how to make it. But there's an awful lot of paper airplanes in the project now. An awful lot of them. They just get there because they're easy to reproduce. They're easy to pass on. Who knows about the time cost quality of triangle? It's kind of not the tool that everybody uses every week, is it? I mean, you don't do. You only ever use it when people ask you, what are the major drivers of project management? You say, oh, it's time for... See, that's why it passes on. It's a, like a paper airplane in project management. There's a lot more two drivers than projects than just those three. But we just kind of learn the three, because they're easy to pass on. They fit for the environment. Some of, these, some of the languages that we have, so for instance, um, see so 
So if I want to talk about spiritualism and connectedness and meaning, I want to, if I want to have that sort of conversation, we can do it here in an environment like this where we've got pools and we've got like we can have candles and we can We can have the right environment, we can talk about stuff like that. You can talk about things like that. You can't talk about things like that in the cold IE cults. Right, from the frozen food section in Woolies, this sort of conversation doesn't make sense at all. Right? You just can't talk about that stuff. Nobody can look. So if you're standing in a boardroom, you look at my desk in my office. My desk is covered in stuff and it's messy. And I'm probably sure yours is messy and I don't know what I If you go to a boardroom, it's polished and clean and there's nice cups on the side. You can't talk about the messiness of the world. You have to talk, you have to use words like strategy and business way, a benefits realization. You have to use all these words. See, those words make sense in that environment. By talking about dealing with the stakeholder might not feel too good like this. That's not going to, they don't want to hear words like this. So a lot about what we talk about also is fit the environment. So I'm going to give you something there which is going to really keep you awake. I know. And that is some of the things give people a fix when they pass them on. So let me talk to you about this chair. Plato talked about this. Talk about beds and chairs. See, you've got a chair like this, right? So the chair like this. It's got four legs on it. There's a chair like that. There's a chair like that. There's lots of chairs. There's Maybe other chairs, you've got chairs at home with different things. So if I, if I roll all these chairs up in the line, I put them all in the line, say I have 20 odd chairs out here. And you look at them and I say to you, what's the similar thing about these chairs? I want the essential chair. Give me the essential chair. What's essential about these chairs? One of the things you do is you start talking about this thing, the bit you sit on, and then you have a back. Like you've got to have a back, because if you just, that's chairness. Right? If you just didn't have a back, that would be stoolness. So you've got to have a back to it, that means it's chairness. But then if I say, well, where's your legs? Well, you can't put legs on this. Because as soon as you put legs on this, it becomes a particular chair. It becomes a chair like you've got in your dining room, or a chair like this one. Or some chairs don't even have legs, they're stuck to a wall or somewhere. So this is a universal chair. What I want to tell you is, and this is the bit that I hope will keep you up with me, okay? And that is this, the thing that makes that chair work is missing on the day. So I'm going to say it again. The thing that makes this chair work is missing on the day. How do you think we come up with this stuff in textbooks? All those diagrams that you see, where do you think we get them from? We get them from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 15 companies. And we look across them and we say, right, how do they manage risk? Well, they manage risk like this, and they manage risk like this, and they manage risk like this, or like this, and like this. And then we look along and we say, well, what's common about all those? And then we draw it. We draw it. We draw the riskness. But the bit like with the chair, the bit that makes this work is missing off the diagram. Because if I put a bit on there, it makes a particular one, like the one you got in your work. So all these diagrams are fundamentally flawed. Can you see this? As is all the diagrams you look at. This is called a problem of induction. So it's a mistake that we make. Here's the tragedy about this stuff. I've seen people stand in front of groups and they say, this is what we like, this is what we aspire to, and I think I hope you don't. Because if you build that, it won't work. In the same way as if you build the chairs like that, they won't work. You can't sit there. So, some of the stuff, but nevertheless, you see, if you could explain something to someone, you remember I said there were reasons why these things get passed on. Uh, some things are easy to pass on, they're like paper air kind of thing. Some things give people a fix. Because you can explain to somebody how something works. That's just your idea. 
it's just like the chain thing. Probably doesn't actually work like that at all. Okay. Also, the trouble is, is these little, these, when we have these bodies and bones like this, they're a little bit dangerous. So I'm going to show you how. What I like you to do is, don't break it, then you've got a glass near your feet or something. But what I like you to do is I like you to stand up for a second. So we need to stand up for a second. So what I'm going to show you is, is we're going to be bacteria, okay? So we're going to be bacteria that's infected. Just watch glasses if they're moving forward. We're going to be bacteria that, uh, that's infecting some part of uh, somebody's body somewhere. And somebody goes off to uh, the doctors and, uh, and they get some bad biotics, right? And the doctor says to you, and he says, right, you've got nine days course of this antibiotics. You have to take them all. Every single one, never mind whether it starts looking better or not, you have to take them all. So you say, yes, 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 yes. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to have a little bit of an experiment. Everybody with red on, like I said, I'm going to ask people to sit down in a second, but those people that have red or a purpley red or version of red on, no matter what I say, do not sit down. Okay? Don't sit down. So, we take the first a lot of drugs. And those people that have blue on, could you sit down, please? Wow, okay. Remember, if you've got red on, or purpley red, stand up, okay? Pink. That looks like red to me. Okay. So first of all, I've a few couple of days we've had this drug, and it's wiped out. Um, we took out the people that had to do Those who've got black on, remember, if you've got red still, don't sit down. If you've got black, sit down. Okay. So now we've got a group of people that are left with red on. All of a sudden, this looks very red on. I don't want to know if I can't see it. <laughs> so, okay, cool. So, what happens is this. You see, the body says, oh, no, okay. The person says, oh, it's all gone. I'm cured. I'm not going to take the rest. It's pointless. I'll forget taking the rest of the drugs I want. So this is what happens. You see all the ones that are left? This lot here that never got wiped out with the bacteria? They're left. Do you know what they're going to do? They're going to breathe. Not in front of us, <laughs> but that's what they're going to do, right? They're going to replicate. Now here's the trouble. When you wipe out a set of ideas, you leave a set of ideas left like this. When you stop other ideas being around and about, when you just wipe them out, all right? You're left with a group of this. There's no competition. You're all gone. They, they can do what they like. See, previously, you were munching away on whatever part of the body it was, right? And they were contained. They're not contained anymore. They can do whatever they like. They can take over completely. Thank you very much. So when you wipe out ideas, when you have a particular group that wipes out ideas and stops ideas progressing, it's quite a dangerous situation to be in. Now, what's this going to do with Project Management? Has anybody heard of line of balance? Have you heard of line of balance? A few people. It's a fantastic. If you are ever, if, if there are people managing construction projects and you are not using line of balance, you are missing out. It is a fantastic tool. It is far, far better than a Gantt chart can ever do. And anybody that I ever show them to it, show them this tool, they think, fantastic, why am I using this? And the reason you're not using it is because the Gantt chart has just taken over. Like that red bacteria at the end, it just subsumes everything. So those ideas out there, they've been wiped out. Wiped out. I'm going to get even more depressing now. So I'm going to tell you about a situation that just happened in the UK. What I'm going to say to you is that it's threatening your freedom. See, what you'd like to do, you know those drawings that you drew? 
or you'd like, because you'd like some tools to help you deal with the situation like that. All right? You'd like a tool in your hands that you can use to help you with the situation like that. And you have a lot of them. And that's because people are focusing on other stuff. So this is happening here in the UK. So this is chartered status. So the APM, which is the UK's professional body, they have been pushing for many years to produce chartered status. And in order to get this chartered status, what they're doing is they're wiping out the PMI, basically. If you've got a PMI qualification in the UK, and they get chartered status, your PMI qualification is nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because these people will be uh, controlling, if you want to run major projects in the UK, you have to have a chartered status qualification in the APM. Anything else won't come in. So you have to stick to what they do. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly, I don't know what time, I'm quickly going to tell you about these two little tools. So let me just sum up for a sec. What I want to say to you is this. I think there is a situation that you'll be exposed to in project management, and that is that a lot of the stuff you end up talking about is just like the fruit and veg you find in one is. It's been picked for you. There's a lot of interesting other stuff out there that's been wiped out. It's been out there, like the line of balance stuff and the activity and our stuff. It's out there. There's really good tools that you could use them. So if there's one little simple thing you can have a look, it's have a look at that. But also, what we're, not, we're not talking about this idea of capability. So let me give you a couple of examples of this. We've got a couple of tools over here. Um, so a lot of these tools develop, these tools are developed under our PhD program that we've got at the university. Um, so this basically points out to you that something, know-how, the know-how for doing something, is stored over different systems in the organization. So the individual person, their head, the culture, the values, the social, how people interact with each other, the technology, the processes, the infrastructure. Things aren't in one spot. Adam Smith told a little story. And he said, uh, I'm going to pretend now, this is a nail, right? So he said, this is a nail, and the nail maker has to make 400, 200 nails a day. So in the nail maker shop, so it's Adam Bill, the hammers and the forge and all the bits and pieces. And then they will produce the nail. But there's a lot of other shipbuilders coming around and they want more nails. So now we need to the ante to produce more nails. So this was his conversation about the division of labor. So he said, so what we do is we get another person. So let me get a volunteer. There's my own nail name. I picked it because he was your name. <laughs> right? So we're going to make a nail together, right? So as we're making a nail, what's happening is, is I, want, I want to use your, the bit of the angle you're on, and you want to use the bit of the forwards that I'm using. So we argue and squabble for a bit, and then after a while I say, look, look, wait a minute, you stay and do the banging and stuff with the hammer. I'll go over here and heat the nail, right? And we split the, we split the labor. Well, that's all this, right? So, more people. See, but the trouble is, what's this? If I made 200 nails, if you make 200 nails, we make it 400 nails. But if we split the job, we can make about 550. Because you actually become very good at what we do, and I become very good at what we do. We get more nails. We need more nails. We need more people. So it's not just 200, 400, 600. We could probably make about a thousand nails a day. So you, you don't move from the anvil. You don't move from the forge. And all I do is pass the tool back for we're making a team, right? However, what you've got to realize is this. This is the important point here. Not you can't make this nail anymore. This is a brilliant nail. It sells fantastic. You can't make it. If I left you in the forge on your own, you couldn't make that nail. Neither could you, neither could I. You need the three of us to make that nail. Because you do something to it that's really particular, you do something that's really particular. The point is this, the know-how for making this nail is stored across the three of us and the tools that we have. That's where this nail is. Okay? Capability. Capability. Here we go. 
the capability of producing this metal is stored across the three of us and the equipment. Thank you very much. Check your watches and you sit down. Okay. Is that okay? Did you get that? So capability is stored across all these systems. This is why when we go into organizations and we have these big, big, big restructures and we start cutting and looking around and stuff, we can't do anything by the end of the week. But we bang it up the system, right? Our capability has been diminished somehow. So when we're talking about delivering project work, projecty work, spiky work, when, we, when we're thinking about doing this, we better figure out that we've got all the systems in place that can enable us to do this job. That job that you drew about, that you were thinking about, is the ability to do it is, is across all these systems here, or not, as the case may be. So that's one tool that we've got. And that's up and running, and that's been used in organizations out here, well, probably the other end of the time, actually. So we've been out there testing this, and where does this come from? This comes from actual project managers' experience. So we didn't make this up. We didn't put it out there so that we could test people on it. We just derived this from people's practical experience. The second one, this is called the project space model. So, so how common sense is this, right? I'll just explain it to you. I've got the, the papers that are produced on all these, I've got them in the table as I hand out at the end. I'm going to show you how all these work. So here's a, here's a simple rule. Forget the topic for a minute. This is the bottom one. This is where you are now. You're always now. You're always now. This thing doesn't move along. It just stays there. It turns color when things are going wrong. So it goes red when things are bad and perhaps green when things are good. Right? But it's a bar here. Now this is, this is a great tool for standing in front of a board. People who've got the power to change things and want to know where you are in terms of your project. And you can say this, you can say two things. See these green triangles? Because we've got numbers of what they are. These green triangles are helping us. They're pushing us forward. These are the system, the people, the processes that we need. And they go, good, thank you very much. We like them. See these orange things? They're stopping us from moving. If you want to know why this project is behind, they, they are. Now these people in this room, if you have all the power to move them, then we're going to be stuck here all the time, right? Can you see how simple this tool is? So in terms of being right in the, answering some of the things that you were scribbling about here yeah, when you're on, this is this is this is presenting to a group of people who are saying you need to move this stuff in order for us to progress. See these things here? These are the things that could drop down. This is another way, a uh, visual way of looking at risk. See these things? They can drop down and cause us a problem. So this tool, if you were to think of like a cockpit or a, even an aircraft, right? Here's a met metaphor for you. This is the aircraft that's taking off. And these are the things that are helping you stay up there. And these are the things that are going to cause you a problem. And if they're causing you a problem today, these people in this room, if they've got the power to change them and stop them, then they can. But then what you would do, you'd go back, press the button and break. If you go back to the other one, the one with the systems in it, you go back to fix it so that it never happens again. Every plane that takes off from the airport is streaming back down. Every plane that takes off is streaming back down. And it's streaming back data, and there's an aviation system that basically changes how we fly planes tomorrow. So this is a tool where we should be streaming back information about what's, what's helping us, what's stopping us, and then we use the other tool that I was talking about previously to make sure that it doesn't happen again in the future. So we're kind of wiring ourselves for capability to deliver these projects. You see this? So, I'm going to wrap up. So, all I want to do is I just want to just quickly touch on these, these other little points for you is that we need to be having a conversation about capability. You're not. Project management isn't. It may be on 
blogs and so forth that people are having a discussion. But the main thrust of things like the PMI, the AIP, and so forth, we're not talking about it. We're talking about all these little other tools. Like the Gantt chart, you want to even invent it. Project work, right? So we're talking about stuff like that, and we should be focusing on things like capability. And when I say capability, I mean, if we're about to do a job, and it looks like it's going to be a bit spiky because we haven't got all the capability that we need. We've got the right stuff around us. We can rewire this. We can start to think about how, how can we wire our systems so that we can make this thing work. And if not, if not, how are we going to deal with it? Now, I think something that Tim and I were talking about earlier on, See, there's another aspect which we're going to get to talk about here. You know you talk about leadership skills and all these sort of soft skills? Well, that skill comes into play when you just can't fix it, when you can't get those capabilities, and you can pull your sleeves up, and somehow we've got to lead our way through this. We've got to work our way through it. That's, that's when those type of skills come in. But again, it's grounded, and all this is grounded in the idea of what project work is. It's work for which we have a lack of paucity of capability. Forget all that other stuff about start and finish on the last Okay. So when you finish, and I mean absolutely finish, uh, I've got some uh, notes which I'll put up on the table there. They are a more descriptive version of this thing here and the other tip tool that I was using previously. Uh, if you want to know more about that sort of stuff, you can email me directly. Those people who know me will tell you that I'm very good with answering my emails. No, I don't understand. Um, so, uh, I think we're gonna, what are we going to do next? Because I, I, I'm asking because I don't know about the technology. Is that okay, folks? Are you all right with that? All right, okay. Sorry.